All right. I know what you're thinking. What is this guy doing up here? I thought it was a worship night. I would have stayed home if I knew somebody was talking. Well, I am glad you're here because I really believe that God has something very special for you tonight. And if you haven't already heard his voice through worship today, uh, I'm going to try and spell it out a little bit more because he is already speaking. If you're listening, he has something to say to you. Um, before we get started, I, I need to, I need to like, uh, not print a retraction, but like make a, an addendum to last week. I was, I was told I didn't finish a story that was really kind of crucial, and I really believe I did. Now, I didn't go back to the tape. You know, you've seen those commercials where they throw, like the insurance commercials where they throw the red challenge flag. I'm not going to go that far, but I told a story about how um, I, had a, I found a pair of headphones from a friend of mine and felt extremely impressed uh, in, uh, by God to make it right that I still had them. And I was told that I didn't end the, I didn't like tell any more of that story. So whether I did or not, I did buy the gentleman uh, new headphones. So I, d I did act on what God was putting in my heart. So in case anybody was wondering, um, and uh, you know, if you happen to look at the tape, just let me know if I, I did it or not. Just settle a bet, you know. I did. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about Jonah, okay? And we're looking at how Jonah's life and the story told about it impacts us when it comes to how we see more of God in 2024. How can we have more spiritual revelation of who God is, what he's done, and what that means to me, means to us this year, so that we can have hope and power? Is there anyone who thinks we need more hope and more power this year? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And let's just look real quick to pre preface this, Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. I pray, this is Paul writing to the church, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given the, to those he called, so his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance, that's you, rich and glorious ones, okay? Also, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of his power, and this is going to be key to what we talk about today, for us who believe him, okay? So if you notice, I added a little emphasis on the end that wasn't there last week. Is it? Oh, it is up there. It's underlined even. Awesome. So in seeing God more and receiving hope and power as we uh, see him, we're going to talk about three questions. Last week we talked about, do you love God? And so we saw in the first chapter of Jonah that to love God is to keep his commandments, and Jonah didn't do a great job of that. So we'll call it a cautionary tale in chapter one. The second question, which we're going to look at tonight, is do you trust him? And the third question, which we'll talk about next week, is do you love his people? And these three questions are questions we can ask ourselves and hopefully find an answer so that we can see God more, enjoy that hope and power, and have that spiritual revelation to, to impact 2024. So we saw that Jonah walked in the opposite direction. Even though we know as a prophet, he probably didn't think he was going to escape from God, he was doing everything he could to put God out of his vision. 
and it brought a tempest that pulled everybody else into it. And thus he ended up in the sea in a pretty dire and in all normal circumstances, a terminal situation. Let's recap a little bit the background of Jonah. So if you turn to Jonah in your Bible, if anybody still has one of these, um, if you went to Micah or Habakkuk or Habakkuk, I guess it depends on where you went to Bible school, um, you've gone too far. So just back up a little bit. It's the, like the two tiny little pages right before that. And there you'll see Jonah. And Jonah was a prophet. This takes place in 782 to 745 BC. Nineveh, the town we talk about, was in Assyria. It was on the verge of being overtaken by its enemies. This is a historical book. It is not symbolic. This story actually happened, we know, because Jesus refers to Jonah in, in multiple times. And we believe that it was written after the people of Israel left Babylon. So if you think of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, after that time where they were all in Babylon and they came back to rebuild Israel, we believe that's the time that this uh, was written and and disseminated. So today we're going to talk about do you trust God? So I'm actually going to read Jonah in a minute, so don't worry, I'll get to it. Uh, I love golf. Some of you know that. We have a golf league, shameless plug. If you like to golf and you want to golf Tuesday nights, let me know. We'll add you to our league. It's phenomenal. I, when I'm on the golf course, it's just like being outside, being free. You turn your cell phone off unless your wife calls you two times, and then you know it's for real. Um, but I saw a guy get a hole in one. I golfed with a guy, and I watched him get a hole in one. I was less than one foot away. And it was a pretty spectacular experience, if you know golf. That's very, very difficult. And um, I actually got a hole in one one time for five minutes. I hit the ball around a blind curve and, it, and we didn't know where it went and I, we couldn't find it and I knew that it was, it was on the green. It was right there. It, it had to have been so close to the pin and it was missing. And the only explanation, of course, as if it was that close to the pin and we can't find it, it had to be in the hole. And wouldn't you know, my buddy had run up to the green ahead of me, and as I came around the bend, he, he picked up my ball right out of the hole, and he said, I found it. And I was like, just beside myself. And I walked up, and I, he gave me the ball, and I was like, wait a second. This is not my ball. And he said, yeah, you're right. Yours is way back there, beyond the green. <laughs> but for a minute, I knew what it felt like to have that accomplishment. It felt really, really good. Um, I feel like when we can see God and when we trust him and see him work in our lives, we can have a similar feeling, not that it's about feelings, but we can have that moment of knowing something amazing is happening in our lives. And the thing about golf is if you want to be good at golf, I'm going to give you a little golf lesson. I am certainly not anyone to be giving golf lessons, but as you can tell, I can't even get a hole in one. If there's two things, okay. Number one, if you want to be good at golf, you have to not do what feels right, at least when you're learning, because whatever feels right is probably wrong, because you have no ability to see outside of your body. You're, you are yourself. You can't step back and see what is right and what is wrong. 
So you can't do what feels good. You have to do what is good. I have a golf app, and if I hold up my camera to the direction of the pin, even if I can't see the pin, it'll show me where it is. Even if there's a hill in the way with the GPS and all that stuff, it'll show me where it is. It's showing me the position that I need, even though it doesn't maybe look right, it shows me where I need to be. The point is that in life, there are two kinds of truth. There's experiential truth, right? What I feel, what I think, and that could change with new information. It's actually the word truth being used there is not really an accurate way to describe it. And then there's positional truth, what God says, which may go against what feels right, but it never changes. And the point here is that it feels good to get a hole in one for a moment. But what's even better is letting go of what I feel and trusting in what is right so that we can hit the mark for real. And Jonah learned that the hard way. And his story is for us to learn from and hopefully not make that mistake or not make it <laughs> as many times as we, we could. So let's go ahead and look at Jonah. And we're actually going to start in verse 17 of chapter 1 because this is sort of the beginning. And, and I said last week in, in the Hebrew text, this is actually the sort of the beginning of the next piece. So in verse 17, after Jonah had walked away, had been on a ship, the ship had uh, gone through a storm, and they, the crew threw him overboard. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. And from this point, we actually go into a different style of writing. It's more like a psalm. And I want to point out before we get into that psalm that why, why couldn't have Jonah just found like a piece of wreckage from the ship, like a barrel or, you know, like a box of uh, styrofoam or something and just floated on that and been okay. But we don't exactly know that reason, but having a fish and telling this story in this time, in this era, would have been a really big deal to these people who would have heard that story. First of all, have you ever heard of the term Leviathan? It's in the Bible a couple of times, many times re referring to a sea monster or a, a large fish, something like that. For these people to hear that God controls something that seemed so evil or big or out of control would have made a massive impression on their understanding of God. And providing that fish shows that God didn't step out of the natural order of things, even though he could. God can create out of nothing. But in this instance, he used the natural order and had power over it. And Jonah was caught up into a fish. So in verse 2, Jonah is in this fish. Now, at this point, Jonah may not even know where he is. I mean, if you think about it, has anybody ever swam in a very large lake with just like one or two feet of waves? You are so far down. And there's this, I went skiing on Lake Erie one time, and it was like two to three foot waves, which... Uh, I don't recommend, but it um, <laughs> doesn't work so well when they get stuck in the wave. Um, but to, 
to be lost in, on a sunny day is extremely scary. Now add wind, a hurricane, a tempest, storm, all this stuff, and maybe hours of trying to weather it. And now you're in it, you're half drowned, it's dark, and all of a sudden it goes dark and quiet and probably kind of clammy. And that's where Jonah is in this moment. And that's why he says some of the things he does. Verse two, he says, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and thou didst hear my voice. For thou didst cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood was round about me. All thy waves and thy billows passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy presence. How shall I look upon thy holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep was round about me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. So he was in a pretty bad spot. Jonah at this point knew something was wrong and had no guarantee that he would get out of it. I think if we look back in verse four, he says, how shall I look upon thy holy temple? In some versions it says, yet yeah, I will look, but this is probably a more accurate. He was saying, in this place, how will I ever be able to make it right? How will I ever be able to get back connected to God? You know, he understands how he got there and he knows he is in a place of potential death. He used the word sheol, which is a, a term for the grave. At the end of verse 6, he says, Yet thou didst bring up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to thee, into thy holy temple. In this case, he's talking about a heavenly temple. In the first instance, how shall I look upon thy holy temple, a physical temple? How can I, uh, how shall I again look upon the, the place where you live, and to them, Jerusalem? And in this sense, my prayer came to thee in your presence in thy holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their true loyalty. Those that abandon God won't feel the constant, loyal, unchanging love. He's talking about people who have yet to accept or people, we can, we can understand this as a people who have completely walked away from God and have never accepted, they will not be able to feel the power of his grace. And this is important because the word loyalty, this love that God has for us, is a mighty, constant, unchanging love. And I want you to remember that as we keep going through here. He is understanding that people who don't know God will never know true love. They will never know what it is to have the true love of a father that no matter what, you are accepted. And verse nine is the, the kind of a turn here, but... With the voice of thanksgiving will I sacrifice to thee. What I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. 
This being said, when he's in a fish with no guarantees of what's going to happen next, in his mind, he's dead. But yet, this experience has caused him to speak something that's true about God, even though his experience in that moment maybe something feel something very different to what is true. And then in verse 10, and the Lord spoke to the fish and vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. So at least the fish is obeying God in this story, right? Even if Jonah is not, the fish is. Um, let's, let's, Look at what's being said here a little bit, and then I want to talk about trust and show you a picture of that, okay? So God used a fish to reveal his control over the nat nat natural elements. He sent a picture to us of the resurrection, a foreshadow of things to come when he talks about being in the belly for three days and three nights. Jesus talks about the same thing in Matthew 12, 39. Jonah is unsure of his future, but yet expressed his sorrow, his gratitude, renewed love, and his pledge of obedience. Now, one of the things I said to keep in mind about the fish and also the time that this was written, which would have been after the exile, is that many of the people who would have first read this story that God was speaking to would have seen, of course, we're only talking about the first two chapters, but as they look at the whole thing, they would have seen a picture of God's mercy with the fish representing their exile and Jonah's deliverance representing their own deliverance. So, that picture for them was very important. And God was speaking to them thousands of years ago in a way that's different than he's speaking to us today. Isn't that kind of cool about the Bible? That it could have been written millennium ago, but we can still look at it and it can be as relevant to us today in an extremely different time when we don't run water through lead pipes like they did in Roman times. That was kind of a joke. You can <laughs> laugh there. Um, this can also represent our own experience of darkness and uncertainty. Anybody felt like they were in a belly of a fish ever? I mean, figuratively. I mean, if literally, I kind of curious, we could talk later, but figuratively, a dark place where God maybe seems quiet, whether your actions or your disobedience got you there, or whether you're just in a season in which it feels like it's dark. Sometimes all we have is a word to hold on to. when everything seems completely lost. Trusting God in the worst moments is important. It shows what's in us. No matter what it looks like on the outside. Even Job, Job 3, 13, 15, he said, God might kill me. He wasn't even sure if God was going to be the one that ended his life. And he said, but I have no other hope. I have no one else to trust in. There is no one that can give hope. There is no one that can give power that has any meaning in this world. So no matter what it looks like on the outside, I still only have one possible choice, and that's God. Psalm 
So how can we trust God in such a hostile world? I'm sure you've watched the news and things that you've seen seem so wrong to you. Has anybody said, how can this be? How could you let this happen? Where are you, God? Has anybody asked those questions ever? Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. What we're going to find out later in this book is you're a human. God made you. He's not offended by your humanity. But there's more than just staying in that place of where are you? Let's look at an example that's the opposite of Jonah, okay? To get an idea of what trust in God can look like. So I'm going to read from Genesis 22 for a few verses here, starting verse 1. God called, yes, he replied. I'll give you context in a second, but that's very different than Jonah, right? You remember in Jonah 1, God called and Jonah went, I'm out of here. (laughs) This guy is Abraham. Abraham was promised a son that would be the conduit of his descendants that outnumber the stars. And something is about to get in the way of that promise. God. You're like, what? God can't get in the way of his own promise. Okay, let's read on. So God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. God said, take your only son. Yes, in case you were wondering, Isaac, whom you love so much. Okay, really rub that in, God. Okay, And go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. And on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there. And then, what's the next word? I will come. No. We. Just keep that in mind, okay? And then we will come right back. So there are three things I want to point out in here that we can take in our lives and reflect on to be able to answer that question, do I trust God? And if the answer is, I'm not sure or no, we can move that needle to the yes side of the dial as we look at this, okay? So three things. Abraham was available, something Jonah was not, right? Abraham listened to God right away and was ready. He was willing. We can see that. Yes, here I am. Later on, After this, a few verses later, God calls him again. He says, yes, here I am. This isn't even a one-time deal. Abraham is ready. He's willing. He's open to receive from what God has. He's available. Last week, we talked about having his commandments and keeping them. This is the having, right? This is the openness, the, the looking to make sure we haven't missed anything. Have you ever had work done in your house? And somebody says it's done, right? I saw a picture. It was, uh, you know, when they put blue tape on things, when, when something's done and they make a punch list. This, this picture had like 8,000 pieces of blue tape. And the, and the caption was, Time to knock it down and start over again. <laughs> All the things that were wrong with it. But 
Uh, you sometimes you wonder when you go in and you inspect something somebody's done and you're like, did you even look here? There's 800 nails still under the, the baby car seat. Did you even clean those up? I'm sure none, none of us in, in here have ever had that uh, where we uh, f- forgot to actively look and clean up anything. Um, Kids are a perfect example of that. But that's Abraham. He was looking and ready and willing to not miss anything God had for him. He made himself available to God. We see in verse 3, the next morning Abraham got up early. Early. I mean, I like the idea of waking up early. But if I don't have to, you know, be nice not to have to. But sometimes you gotta. But Abraham didn't wait around. He acted quickly. What did Jonah do? Went the other way. Bought a ticket to the farthest place that he could. So last week, we talked about keeping his commandments. Not just having them, but actually doing something with those commandments. With the word. Is it a word that came from the past, the present, or the future? We talked about that. You can watch the tape. I don't have time to get into that even more. I want to keep moving here. But he acted quickly. He obeyed right away. Here's the thing, though. On the journey between hearing that word and acting and then actually getting to that place, Abraham had three days If you give me three days to mull over a word I don't like, I could find you a multitude of reasons why I may not want to do it, right? I could could probably make a list and rationalize. Well, this is a little bit farther, God, than I thought you meant. And the donkeys are really, maybe, maybe we should turn around. And maybe you didn't really mean. And, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. He had a lot of time to doubt In this moment. And in verse 5. The last thing. Here is. Abraham. Was assured. So he was available. He was active. And he was assured. He said. We will worship there. And then we will come right back. He used his words. To speak a truth. That he knew but he wasn't feeling in the moment. In verse eight, it says he provides the sheep for the burnt offering. One of the ways that we can do this is by sharing what you're going through with others. This week, for me, let me just tell you, do not aspire to this position. Because it is not always a fun one. Sort of Monday comes and you're like, hey, I'm preaching on trust. This is going to be awesome. And then, boom, you're tested right there. This Monday came and, and I got just news about my business that wasn't devastating, like wasn't a terminal for the business, but it was not great And it sent my mind into a million places of, oh my goodness, did I do the right thing? Am I, I, why does this always happen to me? Maybe I missed it. Maybe, what am I going to do? All these things that I wanted to make a list of things I needed to do right now to fix the problem. But, and thankfully, I had actually been reading this and I thought, wait a second, how am I supposed to stand up there and go through this? And not even put this into practice in some way. And I thought, that's it. If I hold this in, and if I just let it fester inside of me and bubble up, it's just going to start poisoning every thought. And that is then going to cause me to question the positional understanding that I have of what God is saying to me, who he is, and make me need to get in the middle of what he's doing and take over. 
And let me tell you, that's never a good idea. So it's funny, though, when I came home, Jenny said, what's wrong? Probably three or four times before I was able to admit that I got some news that I didn't know what to do with. But I thought, you know what? If I hold this in, it might overwhelm me. Let me bear this with someone else. Galatians 6 says, bear one another's burdens. As soon as I told her, it was like a weight lifted off. Like, I don't have to do this alone. There's someone else that can help me, that can speak the word to me, that can remind me of who God is. And that's one of the great things about having a body of believers, is that we can share that load like a truck carrying a heavy weight. That's why there are so many tires on it, to spread it out so not one is holding everything. And that's the beauty of, of who, we, who we get to be in the church. In verse 14, he made the sacrifice on that altar and the Bible says that to this day, the people still use that name as on the mountain the Lord will provide. That place became a memory of who God is. Do you have a memory in your life? Do you have a place, do you have a moment where God showed up and he did something? And in the moment where the seas are crashing over you, where you feel like you're going into the depths of darkness, you have that moment, that altar of where God did something. And maybe it was even in somebody else's life, and you saw that, and you can go back to it. That's why songs can be so powerful. You know, have you ever sung a song through a trial and come through it, and now that song means something that it's never meant to you before? We sang one tonight for my wife. That's an, that is a memory she will never forget. And every time that song is sung, she's reminded of the power and the hope that she has through trusting God. God provided the ram. Abraham did not get in the way. How do we be available? How do we be active? How do we be assured? We have to empty ourselves of ourselves. That is something Jonah could not do and struggled. Well, we're going to look. He struggled to do that throughout the rest of of this chapter, of this book. Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Are you struggling with something right now? Help someone else. It seems ridiculous. But so does turning my shoulder like that so that I don't hit it over there or over there or wherever wherever they tell you, the coach tells you to do. It doesn't feel right, but it is right. We empty ourselves. We love God like we talked about last week. We have his commandments. We keep his commandments. And we then allow him to mold us into what he wants us to be. And that's how we see him. We step back and we say, you do it. If I get in the way, I won't get that opportunity. But if I step back, I'll get to see the power of God work. So if you have nothing else to hold on to in your life, hold on to the cross and that pledge that no matter where you are, what you're going through, he says follow, and he is worth following even without answers. 
Thank you again for joining us. We pray that you were blessed and encouraged by our service. We invite you to join us again next week. Our services go live every Sunday at 9 a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, and at wordoflife.church. And we also meet in person every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. If God is using our church to change your life and you'd like to help us lead people to life in Jesus through your generous giving, you can do so by visiting wordoflife.church give, or you can text your donation amount to 84321. Follow along with us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube if you'd like to know more about what God is doing in and through Word of Life Church. God is doing incredible things here, and we are so honored that you chose to spend your time with us.